Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. That's the spirit. All right. Uh, my, I'm, my name is Marcos Martinez. <laughs> A likely story. She, wanted, she wrote it out because she didn't want me to talk to her. But that's okay. We're off to a bad start, obviously. I am from Taos and a part of La Coalición. Thank you for coming out to attend La Coalición de Taos Cultural Intelligence Series and for supporting the important work of La Coalición de Taos. La Coalición de Taos is a Taos based community organization whose mission is to facilitate educational experiences to inspire informed community action that benefits the land and water, people, and historical cultures of the Taos, New Mexico area. Your donations and volunteer support help this organization in its capacity to continue to create events like these. Please check out the other events that we have created through our website lacoalicion.taos.com. You'll find the powerful lecture by Oliver Horn on there as, as well as other presentations, films, and forums. You can make a donation through our website and contact us to volunteer. We look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, Dr. Silvia Rodriguez will share her work on Asequia history, culture, and ecology in Taos. After her presentation, we will have a Q&A period to welcome your questions. We will have a mic. We don't have the mic. The, we'll use this We'll mic. use this mic, okay. Where was I? We will have a mic that we will pass around and we're sure to hear your questions because we haven't always been able to hear the questions. Megan will help out with the Q&A period. Please wait for her to pass you the mic before you speak. We're a volunteer-run organization. Uh, your help makes a difference. I gotta underline that. So, uh, remember that. Dr. Silvia Rodriguez is a native of Tausenia and Professor Emerita of Anthropology and a former director of the Alfonso Ortiz Center for Intercultural Studies at the University of New Mexico. She holds a BA in Anthropology from Barnard College, an MA in Anthropology from Stanford University, and a PhD in Anthropology slash Psychology from Stanford University as well. She has taught Anthropology at Carleton College, UCLA, and UNM. Sylvia grew up on an Asequia lateral in the heart of downtown Taos that has since disappeared. She, has drawn, she was drawn to Anthropology because it offered a framework for understanding who she is and where she came from. After earning her doctorate, she shifted a regional focus from Mesoamerica to the U.S.-Mexico borderlands and took the heretical step of studying her own hometown, <laughs> which continues to hold her interest. Her research and publications have focused on interethnic relations in the upper Rio Grande Valley of New Mexico where for four decades she has studied the cultural impact of tourism, the relationship between ritual and ethnic identity, and conflict over land and water. She has conducted ethnographic and community participatory action research with Asequia organizations and testified as an expert witness on behalf of Asequia associations. She currently studies the politics and anthropology of water and collaborates with researchers in various disciplines on questions of Asequia, sustainability, and resilience. Her publications include pop, both popular and scholarly articles, book chapters, and two prize-winning books, The Matachines Dance, Ritual Symbolism and Interethnic Relations in the Upper Rio Grande Valley, and Asequia, Water Sharing, Sanctity, and Place. She is a commissioner on the Asequia de San Antonio de Valdez and a board member of the Taos Valley Asequia Association. So at this moment, I would like to ask you to please welcome Sylvia. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you, Marcos. Good, good. 
Thank you, Marcos. I think the last time you introduced me was at UCL Diego many years ago when you invited me to talk about the Taos Fiestas. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Well, thank you for coming, and uh, thanks to the Coalición for all your dedicated volunteer work to bring off this program. How many people in this room are parciantes, commissioners? Okay, this is dedicated to you. You are my teachers, and you are my inspiration. I work for you. I'll be getting to land acknowledgement throughout my talk. Never do I forget where we are and uh, the monumental uh, mountain and the people who consider it their sacred place, and that has influenced all of Taos and continues to do so. Um, What's an acequia, anyhow? Well, it's a canal. In our case, it's a hand-dug ditch. Uh, I know Miguel doesn't like me to use the word ditch, but I think it's important. The words we use are important. It's an association of water users. To me, the most important thing about the acequia, however, is that it's a process. We think of it as a thing. We think of it as an organization, which certainly it is. And it has you know, thousand-year history in the Middle East, came over. Uh, from Europe uh, with great deep uh, Arabic influence and was introduced really as a colonizing institution, but somehow became an autonomous farmer-managed uh, co uh, cooperative way of managing the commons. How that happened is, remains a mystery that many people haven't thought about hard enough. But anyway, it's the processual nature of it that most captivates me and that is most important. And uh, the term that I would use for the nature of that, which I'll use throughout the talk, is the term moral economy. My talk's going to cover three broad areas. First, history and place. Um, second, culture and moral economy. Third, ecology and the science of Asekias. And finally, the current conditions that Asekias face today. I grew up roughly four blocks north of Taos Plaza at the intersection of Lund and Placitas in a neighborhood that was a lattice work of Asequias. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we lived on a lateral that ran right through our front yard. And so I spent my childhood playing on the Asequia. And you could tell the day they opened the Asequia, you could hear the water running into the Asequia across the yard. And that was the most thrilling thing to find in Taos in the late 1950s. Uh, <laughs> and so my interest, my love for Asekias comes from that, for playing in the ditch as a child. OK, so that's where my love for Asekias for comes from. But back when I was at Stanford, I was not thinking much about Asekias. Um, now we're going to go to place. This is a map of the rivers of Taos in Taos County. Um, can't understand anything about Asekias or anything else if you don't know the landscape and if you don't know uh, the hydroscape, really. Um, when historians and scholars write about Taos or any other place, you can tell right away whether they've just been in the archives or whether they've actually walked the land. Because if you don't walk the land and you don't know where the water runs and how it runs, you don't understand anything. Uh, although an amazing amount of people actually function that way and get, are quite successful at it, um, it does make a huge difference. Once you've seen a place and walked it and spent your life on it, you know the land in a way that uh, no one else can unless they do the same thing, which is one of the things I find so incredibly captivating and admirable about Asequeros, who I can listen to endlessly, just talk about their land, just talk about their ditches, just talk about their cattle, because there's so much knowledge, that it's local knowledge that's embedded in what they're saying that they don't even think about. And I sit there and I say, good Lord, listen to what these guys and these women know. And they don't even think they, that it's anything important often. And it's extraordinary to me to just, just sit and listen uh, around the table at the TVAA, for, for example, when the, you know, people are just talking about what they do. 
Anyway, I'm getting off here. Um, this is a map uh, based on the Taos Valley Asequia Association map, which I further developed, of the Asequia system. And as you can see, there are these main streams that define the Valley of Taos, um, Rio Chiquito, or the, uh, uh, the Rio, del Rio Grande del Rancho watershed, the Rio Fernando watershed, uh, the Taos Pueblo watershed, the water of which, of course, originates in Blue Lake, runs through the middle of Taos Pueblo, dividing it into north and south sides, and actually uh, through, through the town of Taos. Um, next is the Rio Lucero, um, which also, all of these mountains, of course, all of these uh, originate in streams, springs, fed by precipitation high in the mountains, run down these rocky canyons or these uh, forested canyons into the Valley of Taos, and then usually down Arroyos and into the Rio Grande, uh, or into the Rio Puebla, which is the main tributary. The Rio Lucero, and then off to the north, separate watershed, is the Rio Hondo watershed, where I currently reside, and which I won't focus on tonight, but is the main concern, uh, certainly this week. Um, and uh, this month for m many of us. Again, to understand uh, the landscape of Taos, you need to understand uh, how it's laid out in terms of what of land use possibilities. Um, right down, the, the county is divided right down the middle by the Rio Grande, and on the east side is mountain, much of which is not habitable, much is, uh, you know, wild, well, not really wild, but formerly wild landscape. To the west of the, uh, of the Rio Grande is La Otra Banda, which is largely sage desert. And if you look at the light colored areas um, uh, in between, I, I can't see if you can see the colors that I'm referring to, the Siena colored, that's actually a very small proportion of the land uh, in Taos, which is irrigable landscape mm -hmm. that's fed by ditches at Biosecius that were created during the colonial period. Um, so it's a comparatively small part of the land that's actually arable and habitable, although of course people are inhabiting areas that in previous times people had more sense than to try to live on. Uh, and that's part of what's going on here. Um, this is a combination of the two. This is a map uh, that I had created for my book based on uh, the, Ase the Taos Valley Asequia one. And you can see the study area um, that I focused on in my book and that I'm still mostly preoccupied inside that area. And so what you see in that map, of course, in red are the main stem ditches, not all the laterals. It would be impossible to include all the laterals, I think, in a single map to scale. Um, but the, it, one of the important things to understand about the, 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 the entire system uh, which was probably dug in stages rather than with a master plan, although there's some evidence that the central ditches in the, in the lower Taos, in the middle Taos um, um, part of the watershed may have been dug in coordination with one another because of how the desagües feed into uh, the river. But we don't know the history of how the ditches were dug, who dug them, or exactly when they were dug. I think the oldest documented a sequia in the Taos Basin is 1715, but clearly they were older than that. Um, and uh, it's probably the most elaborate system, a sequia system in New Mexico. And it reaches, when you consider the laterals, almost every arable piece of land in the valley can be reached by at least one lateral uh, off a, a main stem of sequia. Another really important thing to know about Taos County um, is who owns the land. And this is an important thing. As you can see from this, that um, only 38% of the land in Taos County is privately owned. The majority of the land is owned by the government, the federal government, state government, and I subsume under that tribal lands, since they are held in trust to the federal government. Um, and you can see the yellow are, are the incorporated areas. And so there's checkerboard on the, uh, on the west side uh, and again, uh, how little of the land in Taos County is arable and who is the major owner. And of course, the fact that most of the land is owned by the government has all kinds of implications, including a very small tax base, which is part of the cause of Taos, Pueblo, or Taos County's poverty, but there are many causes to that. This is a slide based on a painting done by um, Manville Chaplin, probably working for the Kit Carson Museums, that imagines 
what irrigation looked like in the early days of the settlement of Taos Plaza, or Taos, which is located on a hill. And here, here you have, um, let's see, I actually have a pointer. We don't really know what Taos Plaza looked like. We imagine what, we, what it looks like. There are no, of course, early photographs. All the photographs are American. Um, does, can you see that, or does this work? Yeah, you can see. I can't see it, actually. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's the hill. They imagine an enclosed plaza, which it may well have been. Um, as you leave the plaza and going south, and you go down that little hill, um, Chapman imagines um, that uh, this whole area down here, which is fed really by waters from both the Rio Fernando and the Rio Pueblo, was irrigated um, at the base of the hill. That area really is the, was the first source of water for the town. Uh, occupied now partly by well number five. And of course, at one time, you can see there, right there, uh, he has a little pond, which apparently was dug out by Ben Randall around the turn of the first 20th, 20th century to become uh, what was known as La Tuata Pond, sacred to Taos Pueblo, um, that was paved over to make a parking lot for the first Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, in the late 1970s. That whole area, that whole crescent that goes around the, the east side of town to the south side of town and then heads into Ranchitos is a water-rich area that's mostly been destroyed by development and landfill. Uh, but the water uh, table is still pretty high there. These are the, um, what the Asekis probably looked at looked like the red lines at the time that I grew up in the 1950s in Taos, where they were all over the town, right through the town. Um, this is what they probably, the, the still operating laterals in the town today. Uh, so there's been a major reduction. Of course, modernization eliminated uh, the, 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 the Asekis. The town, some of the water of the Asekis was um, rededicated to the municipal water system, but the town very casually for many years just filled them in uh, and covered them over and forgot about them and, in violation of the law because everyone thought, well, we're modernizing. These are things of the past. They're backward. They're inefficient. Um, and we're mo moving ahead. And let's just forget all about the Asekis because they're really something that is doomed to disappear. And good for them. And of course, they've only recently realized what a terrible mistake the town made in doing that. And they're trying to redeem themselves, but they've got a long way to go. Um, this is a map made by a map maker that actually gives you a sense of all the irrigated properties in the town area um, irrigated by the Rio Pueblo. So you can see there's a, a vast amount, much of which is no longer being actually irrigated. The Asequia Madre still feeds laterals. There's still irrigation going on. But as you, the, the, the more central, the, the closer you get to, this, to the town, the more disintegrated the, the Asequia systems are for a variety of reasons. As you move outward into the communities that are trying to protect themselves against annexation by the town, uh, the more uh, intact and operating the Asakias are. OK, now this is a little also bit of land acknowledgment. This is the land uh, in the Taos area owned by Taos Pueblo. And you can see it's a huge, significant tracts within the town. This is not include. Um, well, it does actually. The circle is the town of Taos. So this includes what's in the mountains, tract A and tract B. What this map indicates are the wet and irrigated lands within Taos Pueblo, which are also considerable. Uh, the wetlands are to the west and include, of course, the famous buffalo pasture sacred to Taos Pueblo. Um, east of that and surrounding the village are irrigated lands, irrigated by their own um, uh, channels, the history of which and the nature of which are not well known to outsiders, uh, including myself. I think of the uh, buffalo pasture is like, you know, somehow some people say that the Amazon uh, is the lungs of the planet. Well, I think the buffalo pasture is the lungs of Taos, uh, along with all of the wetlands that existed, but that were also extended by the creation of the Asequia system, which of course extended the riparian habitat, feeding bio, uh, uh, biodiversity, and extending the green belt. So in a sense, Taos, the greenness of Taos, uh, like the green ribbons, as they're called, of all northern New Mexico, are creatures of the Asequias, uh, which you know really extended it. We don't know what it looked like um, before the Europeans got here. Certainly, it must have been a teeming 
uh, area of, of, of uh, water-rich lands, but the combination of uh, the creation of the acequias with what was here really made Taos a beautiful green area that is now, of course, drying up. And that's the green belt uh, within the, the larger context of Taos. So we have this beautiful green belt, um, which is being systematically uh, dr dried up through landfill, through building, contrary to actual uh, policy of the town uh, and, and the county still continue to do that. Uh, Valverde Commons being a more recent example. So even though we know better, we can't help ourselves. Uh, it seems as a species, not, to, not just as a town, but as a species. We can't seem to really get a grip on what we're doing. Okay, now what this shows um, is a map I had created for my book, which shows the acequias, um, the rivers, but also the parish system um, established in the colonial and in the Mexican period and the modern period. There are three major parishes in the Taos area. The central one uh, is uh, dedicated to Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is, we're inside that parish right now. Um, the, the Rancho area, the Rio Grande del Rancho, is um, the San Francisco parish. Of course, the mother uh, church for that is the, one of the most famous architectural structures in North America, which is, of course, the beautiful Rancho's church. Um, and then in the north with the mother church, uh, or the seat of the parish at uh, Arroyo Seco, the Holy Trinity Parish, which encompasses um, the Rio Hondo, much of the Rio Hondo watershed, um, and all, extends all the way to San Cristobal. This is important because of the settlement pattern in Taos, which was um, really the creation of these placitas in some succession that is only partially documented. And there's one placita that's named in one of the early census, in the earliest census, that nobody's ever been able to fully identify. Corina Santa Steven tried, others have tried, called Santa Gertrudes. But all the others we know, about 14 or 15 of these small, somewhat what you might call satellite communities that surround Taos, that are part of what is effectively a multi community. And these were settled all along. Um, the tributaries of the Rio Pueblo in the upper and lower and uh, middle and uh, parts of the watershed. Um, and uh, with settlement, most of these settlements were, not all of them, uh, were centralized or were required to be centralized during a certain period of the uh, 18th century for defensive purposes. But they established sort of their, their territories. Uh, so the original placitas or the early placitas are characterized first of all by the acequias, because the first thing that the settlers did, and this was true uh, with Oñate's first settlement, was to dig the ditches, uh, to divert water from the streams in order to feed the crops. Certainly the early acequias um, on Oñate's settlement and probably others, and probably here in Taos, were probably dug by coerced native labor. But eventually the settlers had to dig their own ditches. Um, and this network of ditches really defines in many ways these communities, but then also in many cases a central placita uh, with a patron saint. So these original communities are all have their patron saints. So, um, you know, there's Our Lady of Guadalupe, there's San Francisco, but each of these smaller missions to the, uh, to the larger uh, uh, parishes also have their patron saint. So in some cases, like Valdez, the, the perfect, beautiful, enclosed placita to San Antonio, but also in the Loma, where my family came from, uh, the Trujillos, there is another little placita dedicated to San Antonio, which is also an enclosed placita that's now completely gentrified. Um, so this pattern of um, acequias, placita, and in some cases they were uh, more dispersed settlements, uh, but certainly dedication to a saint, a campo santo, and in many cases a morada or a chapter house for the cofradía de los hermanos penitentes, uh, which really takes off really much more in the 19th century, uh, but it's certainly rooted in the colonial period. Uh, this is the settlement pattern. And when I was working on my book, um, which I was doing uh, potentially as an expert witness for the Abeta case, one of the things I was asked to look at was not only customs of water sharing on two streams principally, but also the cultural meaning of water, the, the cultural and religious meaning of water. And what I found in mapping uh, and doing um, ethnographic and ethno-historical research um, was that there was a great deal of proximity between sacred sites and the acequias. Not necessarily that it was planned that way, it just worked out that way. So if you look, for example, in the uh, Rio Grande del Rancho watershed, you have two 
uh, uh, still functioning uh, uh, moradas there, both of which are, just happen to be located to ma near, next to major water sites. In the case of the Talpa, the, uh, the Deposito, which is a reservoir that was created, uh, I think in the 19, late 1920s, to store water. Uh, and then if you look at the one in Rancho, it's a water tower that was put in much later, but just right next to the morada. Um, so I became interested sort of in uh, how people move through space. Uh, and found in uh, looking at religious processions, I became very interested in the processions and where they go and the identification of sacred sites within the Catholic tradition. Of course, the whole area is filled with sacred sites from the standpoint of Pueblo religion, which is their own business, and I live learned from an early age not to go sticking my nose around in any of that, but to respect and acknowledge it. Um, but there are many sacred sites that include not only the chapels and the churches and the moradas and the campos santos, but actually smaller uh, uh, kinds of sites, in some cases um, grotto virgins. There are many such sites in the top of foothills, as a matter of fact, sacred to, uh, which have been overlooked and ignored um, and are now being desecrated potentially or in fact by this trail system uh, that's being proposed. So the landscape is actually um, covered with sites that have deep cultural meaning. So this, is a, this is a cultural landscape, and the way in which people move through it, particularly in religious procession, is very significant. And I became very interested in where the processions go and how they operate. And we all sort of take processions for granted, but actually I think they're profoundly important ritual occasions that tell a lot, not only about the people who were in the procession, but about their relationship to each other and the relationship to the place through which they pass. So I mapped uh, a lot of these, and you couldn't possibly map them all to scale. This is a, a fairly modest one. There are also this, the altars that people set up temporarily uh, as descansos uh, on their processions. For example, on Dia de Guadalupe inside the churchyard of the church in town, uh, traditionally people would set up tables that, that represent the mayordomos of the, uh, of the different missions would set up little tables with their own patron saints uh, and decorate them and people, the procession would move from one to another. So the procession and the movement of procession I think is, is very significant. Another way in which people sacralize and continue to sacralize the landscape are all of the descansos that mark where people have died. Uh, usually in, ca in car accidents. And I've watched those over the years grow more elaborate and extensive. They're almost like altars now mm -hmm. uh, than when they first started out. And that's a way in which continue people continue to mark and sacralize their landscape. And also, in, in many ways, it's a landscape of, of sacredness. It's also a landscape of grief uh, mm -hmm. that we see because each of these marks, and people decorate them and, they, and families maintain them. They have to get permission from the State Highway Department to do that. And so this is a place um, that is deeply sacralized by the people who have occupied it and who become in, indigenized to the landscape uh, one way or another. A whole other direction that I could go that I'm not going to know is uh, how and where so uh, what we call Anglos sacralize the landscape and how they're overlapping uh, systems, networks of meaning um, that sometimes uh, are in conflict and sometimes they're operating in mutual ignorance. The whole landscape is, is inscribed with these meanings, all in relationship, whether people are intending to or not, if you look at it in relationship to water. Uh, this illustrates, um, the, the, again, the, the sanctity and place relationship. What you have here are photographs of processional activities uh, associated with particular places. Um, I have in, in the lower corner the Deposito on Good Friday, um, the hermanos and the parishioners of the St. Francis Parish do a procession and an encuentro uh, right there on the, on the uh, banks. Of the, de, of the Deposito. Above that is, um, and I think they still do it, even though it's highly gentrified, uh, the people who uh, live in La Loma and uh, for whom the, uh, the Placita de San Antonio is uh, the center of their traditional uh, place, which was true for my family, also do a little procession just around that little Placita. Um, uh, the higher one is the, pla uh, is the uh, procession that's performed on Dia de San Antonio, which is coming up uh, on um, June 15th by the people of San Antonio, now known as Valdez, in which they have a mass in their chapel and then have a procession down to the river, not far away from the uh, 
uh, from the chapel where the waters are blessed, and then they proceed back to the chapel singing and playing, uh, singing hymns and also playing music, and then go into the Escuelita, which is the old school, now the community center, and have a potluck. Um, the other one is the uh, procession of San Isidro, uh, San Isidro being May 15th, which I documented in the book in great detail, which I understand is no longer being performed, unfortunately, possibly after Corina Santa Esteban, who was sort of the, the patroness uh, and the, the teacher of that tradition, <coughs> passed away. A very elaborate novena that they conducted and processions in each direction um, at the end of the nine-day ceremony uh, to bless the fields and to carry the bulto of San Isidro, the patron saint of farming. So one of the things that I realized when I was doing, even though I grew up Catholic, and you know, like everybody thought about processions but didn't really think about it until I started thinking, really thinking about what's going on here, I calculated that there were hundreds of processions going on every year. Uh, if you count all of the, uh, the, the holidays, the saints' days, um, there are lots of processions that are going on almost continuously. People often talk about how people at Taos Pueblo, or at least some people at Taos Pueblo, are constantly praying. Well, I think that's true uh, of more than just Taos Pueblo. People are constantly uh, praying and, and carrying on ceremonies in relationship to each other and their place here in the Taos Valley. Um, okay, um, getting on with culture again. Uh, Asekia governance. Um, Asekias, people say, oh, nobody has anything like Asekias. We all, this is, these are unique. Well, Asekias have their particular characteristics, but actually they belong to a family of such organizations. Uh, uh, anthropologists call them autonomous irrigation uh, communities all over the world. Uh, they're found on, uh, in both wet and dry climates. Um, the Balinese water temples and Subak system is one of the most elaborate such systems found in the world. They're found in South America, they're found in Africa, they're found in India. And one of the interesting things is they look, as anthropologists and other scholars have looked at them, is that they all seem to operate by very similar principles, which have been identified uh, by anthropologists working in concert with other kinds of researchers. Um, as, uh, as an operate, a, a system of operating principles. Here, uh, when I talk about moral economy, I'm talking about a system of values and practices <coughs> and sentiments that go with a particular way of sustaining a, 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 a subsistence pattern that requires cooperation. Peasants being notably uh, communities of uh, peasant, uh, peasants exhibiting these patterns. Here, I would say the moral economy of acequias consists of respeto. These are terms, respeto translates as respect, uh, but it's got many richer connotations in Spanish. And I would say anybody who's interested in Spanish-speaking culture, one of the cornerstones is respeto. Um, confianza, trust, another term that uh, bears more uh, connotations than the English. The trust, reliance on someone, someone who you can really tell things, and someone who you know is going to show up and uh, who's dependable. Mutualism, Jose Rivera and others have written extensively about the centrality of mutualism in northern New Mexico, being the principle not only of acequia communities, but also of the cofradías, and also of mutual support um, institutions found among, often among poor immigrants all over the world. Uh, how you survive is by depending on each other, sharing with each other, having a certain degree of trust and reciprocity, cooperation, and reciprocity. These are the cornerstones of Asekia culture. I had to point out that they're also what's largely missing from our larger society these days, as we lament um, the, the sort of moral disintegration that seems to be taking place, uh, not only in this country, but all over the world, with caused by many things, but uh, that seem to be what people uh, are not really acting out on a large scale. Although there are pockets where they do, and I think this is one of the reasons that I think acequias are so incredibly important. Um, now, the moral economy are operating the principles of autonomous irrigation communities that are found all over the world have been identified by anthropologists and also by the work of uh, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, 
uh, who I'll get to in a moment, as consisting of these same principles. So autonomy, that is, even though acequia systems or small-scale irrigation, farmer-managed irrigation systems are found all over the world, they're mostly now associated with small-scale internalized, often <coughs> internally colonized minority populations that are existing within a larger nation-state structure. Uh, so they're autonomous only at the local sense because they are certainly governed over uh, and, and constrained in many ways, and in some cases enabled, as is the case here in New Mexico, by some kind of larger state structure. Alternation, you take turns. Uniformity, we all do it, operate pretty much uh, the same. Everybody might have their own techniques, but there's a great deal of uniformity about how irrigation and the management of the ditch is performed. Contiguity, you, you, your next door neighbors are aligned along the ditch. Uh, proportionality, the distribution of, um, of water and the contribution of labor and fees is proportional uh, to the acreage under irrigation, under irrigation. Transparency, somebody steals your water, everybody knows, <laughs> right? You can, it, it's, people are watching. Um, boundary maintenance, we're very much into that. In sort of, you know, you, you have these sort of uh, often unmarked territories surrounding these, uh, these, uh, these communities that make up the uh, multi-community of Taos. But um, there are all kinds of ways that people know, well, yeah, where, you know, where does uh, Cordillera begin and Los Cordovas end? People know, uh, or at least they used to. Uh, direct feedback. You get right, you know, somebody steals your water, you go to the Mayordomo or whatever, there's direct feedback on that, that you cut off the water. Um, and graduated sanctions. Uh, people operate, uh, they follow the rules because if you don't, you don't get the water, basically or you get, there's some form of isolation that can take place. Here, uh, there are these interlocking uh, institutions that I think are very mutually uh, supportive and they have the same, basically the same personnel. The Asequia, the land grant, won't go too much, you heard about land grants last time to some extent, um, the Merced, um, the Morada, many of these communities, not all of them have their own Morada, but uh, they, neighboring communities may go to a neighboring Morada. Um, and I would add to that the mutual domestic water system, simply because the people who actually operate uh, and populate these institutions are the same people, and they're generally interrelated, um, not only as neighbors, but also um, through affinity and through marriage, uh, and uh, either fictive or real kinship. So they're interlocking, mutually supportive institutions um, that are part of the whole social fabric of uh, colonial and even today modern rural New Mexico. This is a quote from Eleanor Ostrom, um, who was a political scientist, I think, who died maybe 10 years ago, who actually got the Nobel Prize for refuting the dogma of the tragedy of the commons which is still reigning dogma in modern economics, which is basically if you have a common pool resource, whether it's a, a grazing area or a water source, that ultimately self-interest will destroy it. People will destroy the commons through self-interest. And so really the only way that a commons can be properly managed is either by the state or a corporation. And so of course that's been the ruling dogma through a combination of interdisciplinary techniques, experiments, uh, game theory, uh, ethnographic and historical research, Ostrom and her students disproved uh, the, the thesis of the tragedy of the commons. Um, and got the Nobel Prize for doing it. You don't hear much about it, but it's a tremendously important piece of work. Um, and she says, building trust in one another and developing institutional rules that are well matched to the ecological systems being used are of central importance for solving social dilemmas. Now, one of the things that we see when I talked about autonomy and then the state um, is that Irrigation politics in widely diverse settings, such as Bali and Peru, must be understood in terms of conflict between bureaucratic and local forms of understanding. And this is a chart that was developed by the New Mexico Aseki Association, which I use uh, a lot, which contrasts how the state engineer uh, and how water law imposed with, with American incorporation and with you know, the uh, incorporation or the annexation of half of Mexico's territory in the United States at the conclusion of the Mexican-American War, and then the imposition of Western water law in the early part of the 20th century. You had these two different systems. 
Um, and what happened was in New Mexico water law, acequias were working so well and were so well organized is that they left them intact and actually incorporated them into the, into the statutes. So they operate autonomously. In other words, you, your acequia community elects your officers, you manage and govern the water yourselves, but you're still considered actually incorporated as subdivisions of the state subject to state regulation, which is increasingly um, requires administrative and bureaucratic conformity uh, in order to actually, uh, you know, be legal and to be able to apply for money. But the principles are very different. And the most important thing when you talk about water sharing uh, and sustainability in an arid environment is that the operating principle for autonomous irrigation systems, including, of course, acequias, is that you share the water in times of shortage. And a, a system, often a customary way of dividing the water according to equity and need, has made a psychic community sustainable in an arid environment where you have fluctuations, uh, climatic fluctuations and weather fluctuations. So the whole thing that we hear of sharing the shortages, and if there's no water at all, you have to ask for special dispensation, and there's usually a hierarchy uh, of uh, preference, livestock, uh, kitchen garden, uh, that's usually par fairly uniform among Asekia, so there may be particular twists that each individual Asekia has. Because every Asekia, there's a saying in Spanish, cada cabeza es un mundo, every head is its own world. Well, every Asekia is its own world uh, unto itself. Um, and so this whole thing of sharing the water is absolutely essential to Asekia operation. Coming in with Western water law, uh, based on priority system established during mining, is it first in time, first in right? What that means is, in times of shortage, whoever has priority in time has the right to take all the water and can do a priority call. And you can see, and, the, and our whole legal system regarding water is based on that in the West. And you can see, especially in times of scarcity and climate change, where that's going. It's a zero-sum game. So you have these two conflicting regimes operating uh, at the same time. Uh, and this pattern of you know, local operation and then the state is found uh, in other countries of the world. Someone has called the interaction between local and state operation as a shotgun marriage. Uh, it's an uneasy marriage between these two regimes um, that actually, on the one hand, often conflict with each other, but en enable each other at the same time. So uh, it's a complicated kind of marriage, I guess, like all marriages, right? Um, this is one of the events that has uh, affected New Mexico and the rest of the West, well, particularly New Mexico, very profoundly, which is um, the San Juan Chama diversion project. Back in the 1920s, the Colorado River got divided up among seven states in the West. And of course, we're hearing more about that now that the Colorado River is drying up, right? Um, and New Mexico got its allocation. One of these shows the allocation for the upper basin and the lower basin. And this is what triggered the water rights adjudications in New Mexico, starting with Amot and Abeta being the most famous adjudications. There are others. Uh, and there's still some who have it that haven't even been started, like for the Middle Rio Grande uh, Conservancy District. Nobody wants to touch that one. Um, but what this did, because it ostensibly, all the water in New Mexico has for some time been allocated. It's already allocated. There's no new water. Groundwater and surface water, no new water. Which means if you need more water, you've got to take it from somebody else. So here comes the uh, San Juan. Uh, Chama Diversion Project, which actually imports water from the Colorado River, which doesn't actually even run through New Mexico, tunnels through the mountains, crosses the Continental Divide to bring water from the Colorado River into New Mexico. The creation of reservoirs to store that water, to bring the new water into the state, which will allow more growth along the Rio Grande Corridor. But by bringing in new water, they had to determine what the water rights were. In other words, old water, new water, native water, new water. So of course, this is reified and, and actually began to monetize uh, 
the ranking of old versus of earlier versus later water rights. So what does this do from the Rio Grande Valley? Who's got the oldest water rights? Who's been here the longest? The Pueblos, right? So they have or claim water rights from time immemorial. Their interests, their claims are pitted against all junior claims, starting with who got here next? The Asequias. And so that's what triggered uh, the water rights adjudication. It was not the Pueblos who instigated the, the, the litigation. It was the state engineer. But we all got caught up in it. And that has really shaped incredible things here in New Mexico. Include, you all hear about the adjudication, the abeta, and the mitigation wells, and forbearance, and uh, priority claims, all of that stems from the Colorado River being divided up amongst the Western states so they could all keep growing. Yeah. One of the things that happens in the 19, late 1970s, 1980s, is the grassroots mobilization around water issues. Uh, and I, I began doing research as an anthropologist in my hometown around 1980-81. And what, since I have a little time, I'll take a little diversion here. One of the things that interested me growing up in Taos, or interested me after I came back from having lived somewhere else, and having gone to fancy schools and done field work in Mesoamerica, and learned that anthropologists have to study the most exotic and remote places on Earth, um, because why? Well, because we can, because we have actually the power to be able to do that, to walk into a colonized community and presume that we have the right to study them, right? So I, you know, having been uh, well-educated in uh, academic anthropology, you know, picked my research uh, site in the most remote part of Mesoamerica I could find, and I got down there and I realized, holy shit, what right do I have to be in this indigenous community where people have never seen what they said, saw as a lone white woman walking into their village, presuming to understand or research their religion? And it hit me, I wouldn't dream of doing this at Taos Pueblo. I would be ashamed to walk into Taos Pueblo and try to do this. What on earth am I doing here? So this caused me to have kind of a breakdown. <laughs> However, I did stick it out. They were very gracious. Um, and I came back, uh, you know, sort of crawling back to Taos to write my dissertation. And suddenly, after all of that experience and all those books and all those classes and all those seminars in my year in the field, I saw, I saw Taos with new eyes. And I said, my God. What's going on here? What has happened? Um, and uh, this is just as interesting and troubling and shot through with power inequities as Mesoamerica, as New Guinea, as any of the exotic places that anthropologists want to study. But I stupidly thought, oh, well, I won't have the same moral conflicts that I did in a third world country as an American, uh, that I will in my own hometown. And it took me about six months, six months to realize that was a fantasy. Mm -hmm. But I persisted because it was so fascinating. And one of the things that I found, and I grew up in the 50s, is that um, people are, and particularly when I was growing up, and it's still the case, but it's a lot more subtle now, um, everybody knew what they were. And there were only three things that you could be. You could be a Taos Pueblo Indian or an Indian. You could be, now what are we gonna call them? Spanish Americans, Mexican Americans, La Raza, all, uh, Hispanos. What, there's no term that actually is acceptable to every, now it's Latinx, well you don't hear that around here, right? Um, uh, and then what we call Anglos, right? And so anthropologists historically in the United States had, the cornerstone of American anthropology was the study of Indians, right? Mexicans, not so much. They were the issue for sociologists because they were a problem. Uh, and so a lot of the early sociology of Mexican Americans is why are they this, why are they that, what's the problem? Um, and of course, nobody even thought about studying Anglos because we all, everybody assumed that everybody knew what Anglos were and how they operated, which is, of course, I think one of the least studied and uh, most problematic of all groups. But anyway, what I realized uh, was that even though you grew up knowing everybody was one or the others, and the whole 
Enchantment industry of New Mexico is based on this segregated imagination of one thing or another, and these are silos, and change will somehow dilute their cultural integrity and mess them up, uh, and yet these categories and these distinctions persist. Why do they persist? Who keeps them up? And of course, it's partly the enchantment industry, but it's also the state itself. Uh-oh, we're going into critical race theory. Run! Um, which, of course, deals with how, how the structural underpinnings of inequality and the categories of inequality. That's what they don't want us to think about these days. Anyway, what I found was that in the 1960s, in the wake of the civil rights movement, the land grant movement, the uh, Native American AIM movement, um, that suddenly racism was out of, the, out of the closet here in New Mexico. There had been the land grant uh, movement with Tijerina. And, and what I found was that even though people were culturally and linguistically more similar than they had been when I was growing up, their sense of difference and their symbolic expression of difference had intensified. What's going on? So that was really my initial question. I got here and what I found, and I was, okay, I'm gonna look at interethnic relations and social change. And I have my memory of growing up coyote in Taos uh, to draw on, but then I have what's going on. And the first thing I found was, of course, there was all of this mobilization of a sake of sort of these uneasy alliances between hippie environmentalists and um, land-based acequia farmer ranchers over water issues, the transfer of water rights, development. And they were forming these alliances. And there was this mobilization and the emergence of a direct action that growing up in the 50s, we just didn't see uh, in the same way. It wasn't as if all of those uh, issues hadn't always been simmering beneath the surface in Taos. But people sort of you know, didn't talk about it except in private. And one of the things growing up Coyote is that I realized is that Anglos, uh, I talked among each other about the other two groups in a way that they didn't in company with them. And that was true of La Raza. I imagine it's completely true of the Pueblo as well, that I don't speak Tiwa, but you know, uh, when they go into talking Tiwa in the presence of other, you know, what they're saying is, you know, not something that you're going to understand particularly. Anyway, this difference was interesting to me. What was happening was that there were these mobilizations. So it was a, you know, a, a laboratory for studying what is behind these mobilizations. So at that time, there was the Indian Camp Dam issue. Uh, which John Nichols made famous by his converting it into the Milagro Beanfield War. There were the Rio Hondo mobilizations against the, the Ski Valley's pollution of the Rio Hondo. What goes around comes around, huh? Um, the Valdez Condo War in the 1980s, when the son of a wealthy family in Taos wanted to build an enormous subdivision in the central Valdez Valley, uh, by, and it was triggered by the transfer of water rights of the Seque de San Antonio, of which I am now a commissioner a parciante and a commissioner, never did I dream. Um, and the way in which the communities mobilized in direct action uh, to prevent that from happening, um, the water rights adjudication also triggered uh, the, form the formation of alliances and federations of cooperative, uh, first within an acequia, within a stream system, across stream systems, these formation of coalitions. Um, the first one in Taos, the Tres Valles, was against the Indian Camp Dam. Um, and these regional acequia coalitions began to emerge. And then as the adjudication, uh, which actually started much earlier but was activated in the 1980s, the Taos Valley Acequia Association was created to help Parcientes deal with the enormous machinery and expense of having to pair. Uh, to, to deal with the hydrographic survey and defend their water rights. The New Mexico Aseki Association, a couple of years later, became a statewide umbrella and is really a leader uh, for Asequias and, and I believe a, a, a key purveyor of the emergence of an Asequia movement to defend the interests of Asequias. Um, and so these were all emergent um, uh, changes. And really, you have to look at it in the national context because civil rights and the other ethno-political mobilizations, and then later, of course, the, 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 the women's movement, were all part of a, of, a, of a time in which the possibilities and mobilizations were happening, not only in the United States, but actually all over the world. 
Um, so 1980s, water-based activism. Uh, this is a photograph taken, what, almost 40 years ago, of a direct action protest at Taos Ski Valley, when after years of, of polluting the river, uh, the Asequia, the Committee to Save the Rio Hondo formed to try to get that in hand. And it uh, succeeded in getting an environmental impact study process that ultimately resulted in, in the creation of a new sewage treatment plant to control the pollution in the river, but also, of course, to allow for more expansion and expansion and increased expansion. This was the culmination, it was a picket line that was a culmination of a funeral cortege of cars that started at the school in Arroyo Seco, wound all the way up through Valdez, up to the ski valley, bumper to bumper, mm. that was a symbolic funeral for the river. Mm. Mm. Uh, and it was the last day of the ski season, and these bewildered skiers had to cross a picket line to get to the, to the lifts. This was a first for Taos. There was a symbolic, this was the symbolic um, uh, funeral for the river. Most of the people in this, um, except for one who's still inactive, are, are now gone. Mm -hmm. How interesting that what goes around comes around, huh? Mm -hmm. um, the Valdez Condo War, uh, that was an extraordinary mobilization. This was a, a march through town uh, to uh, protest the, the, the building of these condos. Uh, that banner was a banner that was signed by people next to, uh, uh, they picked their fingers uh, to create a stain of blood, and they signed their name and their age. And they went into the Cantina and Valdez to do it. The big thing of blood was actually uh, Rano's slaughtered a rabbit and put it up there. Um, there was another uh, skeleton that actually later the Smithsonian wanted, because this became famous. It was the biggest story in town. Tijerina even came uh, before we realized certain things about Tijerina. Uh, there were signs that were put up all across the valley. And this is one that was very interesting. Commandments against condos. Thou shalt not build condos. Thou shalt not pollute our water. Thou shalt not respect our way of life. Thou shalt not pollute our land. Thou shalt not covet our land and water. Thou shalt not steal what belongs to our children. Thou shalt not kill our valley. And then, of course, the emergence of activism uh, under the umbrella of the New Mexico State uh, Acequia Association, which really is uh, an association that brings together other Asequia associations. And the executive director of that is Paula Garcia, a remarkable person, um, a true uh, brilliant leader, uh, a, a, probably the most important, in my opinion, leader of her generation, organizer of her generation, uh, who is, works uh, out of Santa Fe uh, with her staff, um, who have trained many brilliant young women who've gone on and young men who've gone on. <coughs> Uh, but has really mobilized on a statewide level, uh, the acequias. Um, and so again, el agua no se vende, el agua se defiende, which is actually um, inspired in part by what happened in Copa Cochabamba. I think we have someone from Bolivia here, not far from, from Cochabamba, which of course became famous in its uprising against the privatization of water, which is of course happening all over the world. Uh, finally, we have uh, the, the coming together and the cooperation, the collaboration between scholars, scientists, and activists. And uh, the emergence of a, a new generation uh, of interdisciplinary science research on acequias. Uh, much of which is coming out of, but not just exclusively, New Mexico State University, uh, the Water uh, Resource uh, and Research Institute at NMSU. Um, one of the things that they're most well known for is, of course, uh, under the direction of Sam Fernald, who's the director, uh, who came to a talk uh, that actually was a one that I sponsored of a panelist uh, at the University of New Mexico, in which one of the participants uh, mentioned, which all of you parciantes and irrigators already know, is that if you irrigate, it recharges the aquifer. And if you stop irrigating, the aquifer drops and the wells drop. Well, Sam Fernald and other scientists actually proved it scientifically. And that becomes very important. And these are some of the things that they have charted. There isn't time to go into all of this, but their work is, is inter interdisciplinary. It's cutting edge. And what it uh, actually is looking at is resilience and sustainability. And something that all hydrologists around the world are increasingly preoccupied with is the connectivity between surface and groundwater and what happens when they disconnect 
and it goes on for any length of time, and it can't be reversed, especially under terms of climate change and mega drought, which is eventually sustainability becomes impossible. This is a, uh, a rendition for an exhibit that I created at the university in connection with Weary uh, and, and a grant, an NSF funded grant, that looked at a sequias as integral components of the watershed in which they operate. And this, this is my illustration and, uh, by the late George Chacon, who was a delight to work with, of the hydrosocial cycle which is the, th the not the, the, the deterritorialized abstract hydrosocial cycle, but the hydrosocial cycle as it actually operates in situ in a living place with people and living creatures. And so I talked to George and he came up with this painting, which was part of, which is now I think at Weary uh, in an MSU. Um, this is a really important chart that comes out of this. What this shows is the interconnectivity between the upper watershed, the middle watershed, and the lower watershed. This is something that the people who prepared the environmental impact assessment for Towski Valley should study. Because the whole definition of watershed and impact zone excludes the farmers and the acequias downstream. It really is only the impact that they're concerned with. Of course, there is no impact, according to their study, of this creation of a resort city for the 1% that will mine the waters, the springs at the headwaters. The impact zone is only up there, or at best, uh, the, the canyon that stops at the cattle guard. Mm -hmm. Excluded from this consideration, and not only that, but the developer imagination are the actual people who, who occupy and who have for centuries, and whose whole hydrological and social hydrological system is integral to the watershed. This image uh, illustrates that. And it's something that um, the, the folks, the consultants, ought to really take into account. So this is some of the studies that NMSU graduate students monitoring uh, the water uh, at the flumes on the Rio Hondo. Uh, this brings us back to uh, the adjudication, I will just run through this, the Abeta settlement. This is the ceremonial signing of the agreement in 2006. All the governor, all of the big wigs in New Mexico were there. It was celebrated uh, at, at the Pueblo as comparable to the victory of Blue Lake. Uh, and the Abeta settlement continues to unfold. It's now in the implementation phase, and there have been protesters, some of which are, uh, were seriously misguided as to the facts, but who nevertheless sounded the alarm. Uh, and, and this was a protest that was conducted where uh, a young guy uh, climbed up to the well drilling rig and almost ruined the well and was up there for several days. And um, the water protectors, partly inspired by Standing Rock, joined him. I think not realizing that one of the major protagonists and beneficiaries of the Abeta settlement was actually Taos Pueblo. Um, now, this is what's happening to the Rio, to the Colorado River. And this were taken two or three years ago. It's worse now. It's in the news all the time uh, that the people who divided up the, of the Colorado River realized that the Colorado River was divided uh, and apportioned among the states at a time where the flow was very high. And now it's going down. And they're to the point where uh, they think that if it drops much more, they won't even be able to generate hydroelectrical energy. So the West, uh, the California, Arizona, Nevada, and to uh, uh, in, and our and ourselves as well, so much hinged on the importation of Colorado water, which is disappearing. And what is the West going to do? And they can't figure out how are they going to divide it? Who's going to give up what? Uh, they can't. And and will prior appropriation actually be California's viable? Good. And the, so the, it's going down. Uh, first ever water cuts declared. This was two or three years ago. It's worse now. So today we face mega drought, climate change, the water market, urbanization and gentrification, uh, the cannabis industry, uh, which is water intensive, is moving into the acequias uh, and appropriating or transferring water. And that's going to be transformative. Acequias are now beginning to think, how are we going to protect ourselves uh, against this industry? Um, Attrition has always been the issue. People who don't irrigate anymore, who move away, who are too old to irrigate, who don't pay their dues, uh, the attrition. 
um, is one. The impact of COVID has had a, a large impact and we're coming out of it, but the connective uh, and exclusionary nature of the technology. A second meeting's taking place on Zoom when some of the most important people in the community don't even have a computer. Um, and the receding of community spaces. One of the things that's happened is the church, which has a lot of big legal bills, right? Uh, and is deaccessioning de some of its properties, uh, has stopped conducting mass in the parish missions. In Valdez, in the Holy Trinity, there was a mass on Saturday evening. Now, not at all. Mm -hmm. And so that's very important as a gathering space and as, a, uh, as an expression and as embodiment of mutuality, connectivity, the sharing of prayer uh, uh, within these communities. The church has with, receded from that. The main interest, I think, in the missions is largely uh, for tithing purposes and not for the benefit of the parishioners. And the church, of course, has receded in the past. Much of the ceremonial and ritual uh, practices of colonial New Mexico actually uh, emerged and grew in the absence of clergy and took on their own life and continue today. So anyway, um, my last uh, question is, what lessons can Asekis offer the survivors of ecological collapse? Because that's where we're headed. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Well, thank you very much for that. That was extraordinary. Um, I'm going to try and figure out the question as I'm asking it. It's actually more of a personal question, possibly even a philosophical question, that I'm really hoping to get insight into how you feel about this. So with that question on, on the screen, what lessons can a case as uh, Sequas offer uh, survivors of ecological collapse? And you said that's where we're headed. So having delved so deeply into all of these different ways of sharing uh, resources, looking at a variety of indigenous ways of dealing with that and reflecting on modern ways that we're doing that, it's... Speaking personally, it seems like I, I often despair thinking, why do we, we can't really get a grip on what we're doing and we're sort of running ourselves up a cliff in a lot of different directions actually at the same time. Did you, are you able to maintain a sort of, a form of optimism or what keeps you fired up about doing the work as opposed to just folding and saying, well, we can't do anything about it, we're headed to ec ecolo ecological collapse. But it seems like you're already thinking ahead, you know, how do we preserve this knowledge so that it's useful for whatever our society looks like in the future? Do you ever find yourself kind of despairing and holding your head up? And how do you go about that? Sure. I think that one of the things that we are experiencing, uh, not just in this country, but around the world, is, is what some people call ecological grief. Yeah. Um, we say, what keeps me going? A sec, yes. Uh, the people who operate the Asekias, the ones who have the local knowledge, their, the tenacity with which they defend their land and water, the depth of their local knowledge, and the moral, the col the moral economy <coughs> that still is there. Now, if you talk to m many people on Asekias these days, they will complain bitterly about, oh, it's falling apart, the mud are the most no good, they're stealing my water, people don't want to share. It's, uh, it's this, they'll often describe a disintegrating system. Uh, there are very few asekias that people will say, everything's just fine. You know, admire the most great, everybody shares the water, our books are in order, we have really good bylaws, uh, there's plenty to go around, we share. Uh, I think there are some cases where that still goes on. But what's interesting to me is that they know what the ethics are. And, they, and, and so the reason they're complaining is because they're not living up to the ethics. So there's this sense of a moral economy that's still there. And, and I think that, yes, I think one of the things that's affecting people as the as the, the moral and emotional panic takes root about what's happening to the, to the planet, 
uh, what's happening to the biosphere, um, is that, you know, and I'm sort of paraphrasing from a, a quote from uh, a, 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 an African-American poet who was really talking about white supremacy, but saying is that the sort of e em emotional panic that is being experienced by people because of what's happening to the climate um, is causing people to cling to what they believe is theirs. And she was referring, Claudia Rankin, to the whole thing of white supremacy and the violence. But it seems to me that that's actually happening here too on a smaller scale as Asekias and as communities, traditional communities, struggle to hold on to what they have, what's left of the commons. The Tapa Trail thing. I mean, the, the, the expansion of the ski resort, although they're not really getting bigger, they're just getting better, um, <laughs> is really, uh, which is their, actually their motto, um, is really a, a, a new stage in the enclosure of what is left of the commons. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think one of the things that's pervasive, and maybe particularly people in the cities, is a sense of a lack of agency. What, what can we do? I mean, I don't even know where to begin. You know, uh, well, I recycle. You know, I'm, not, I'm gonna boycott Amazon. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna fly anymore. You know, I'm gonna get a bicycle instead of drive. You know, these, these gestures that, that we make. And I think, well, you know, one of the, I moved back to Taos permanently two years ago and I lived in big cities and I lived in Albuquerque and then I lived in Santa Fe and I grew up in Taos and Taos is definitely part of the third world. There's no question about it. And I sort of find myself bitching about, oh God, you know, you walk into Smith's and there's no food, there's no, where this is becoming a food desert. How can I possibly find, you know, medical care here in my golden years? You know, in a place which is suffering all of the, uh, the, the detriments, all of the liabilities of rural health care which is an issue everywhere. And I think people don't know where to take a stand. And I think one of the things that people who live in Taos, no matter where you came from or how long you've been here, is that the environment rules. You know, the show goes on all day long. The sky, the, you know, the clouds, the wind, the snow, the rain, the mountains, all of the inconvenient things, the blackouts you know, the mud, uh, you know, the rain at the wrong time. It's like, we're not in charge here. No matter what your belief system is, we're subject to this magnificent show that we're, that's, gonna, that's crushing us in some ways, right? And then I think about the farmers uh, and uh, the, the, the ranchers uh, and the small traditional communities that are defending what they have. And I think, Yes, you know, you may win a battle or two, but we're losing the war. But at least they can take a stand. At least there's something that you can fight for. And that's how I feel about the Asekias. That's how I feel about the Rio Hondo watershed. That's how I feel about the Asekias versus the B Corps upstream that is mining the springs to build a, soy, a, a city a resort city for the 1%, without even really betting an eyelash, so that's what they're doing. But they're not getting bigger, they're getting better. So I feel grateful that I actually uh, am on an Asakia, because that's something to work for. It's something to believe in, and it's the people, and it's their connection to the place. And so that's what keeps me from despair, is my neighbors. Yeah? Do you see pickets? Do you see protests? Do you see the road to the B Corp getting blockaded? What do you all think? Yeah. <laughs> what I see is something that didn't happen back in the 80s when we had that funeral for the river, is a much broader base of support than we had then. Across Taos, in unexpected places, Allies emerge that surprise me all the time. They're not necessarily as uh, irrigators. Uh, they may be skiers. A surprising number of skiers mm -hmm. are uh, horrified. Uh, people who've been here just a little while. People who've been here for generations. People who don't like to draw attention to themselves. People who are often the most important leaders of a community are the ones who are most invisible to outsiders. They're not on the radar screen 
of the bureaucracy or the state. And they don't say anything in meetings, but when it comes time to make a decision, everybody looks at them, see where, where, is, where, the, where are they gonna, what do they think? Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, you're, you folks are, are in towns. What do you say? Uh, I guess uh, what I'd suggest to the question uh, that you answered is uh, the acequias are a model of sustainability. Right? And, and, um, and if you look at the practices of the past, uh, my grandfather lived in this house for a time. He, he ran a thousand head of ewes and a hundred head of cattle. Uh, they would cross the Rio Grande in the spring in May. They would graze um, from that, that crossing all the way to Cumbres Pass. They'd spend four months there, and then they would come back. Well, I once asked my father, what did they eat? My God, there's nothing but sage out here. And his answer was, <clears throat> in the 1930s and 40s, there was no sage out here. And so, um, but basically, how could that happen? Well, there are terms now. They, people are discovering this again in terms of things like, uh, what is holistic grazing? Holistic grazing is high intensity grazing in which you move your livestock through quickly. Uh, the monsoons come and everything regrows between here and there. They spent their four months in the mountains and in the fall they came back after the monsoons and the grass was taller than when they left. And again, that is a healthy grassland. Uh, these practices now are being advocated again. But um, they need to be embraced much quicker. Industrial farming is has broken the water cycle. So 70% of our moisture comes from the ocean. Well, the other 30% is it rains, it snows, then it evaporates, and then this moisture moves across the landscape from west to east. So much of that is broken, you know, in terms of, of the, they call it the short water cycle. And it's practices around, um, oh, let's ban cattle on, on national monuments and wilderness areas, livestock in general. You know, in three, 400 years ago, it was the bison that basically grazed the Great Plains, uh, are responsible for, in those days, what was probably 18 inches to two feet of topsoil. And it's been the, the industrial way of farming that has destroyed all of that. Um, Things like, if you hear terms, regenerative farming, that's basically the old practices of our grandparents, great-grandparents, how they took care of the land. Otherwise, the land will not take care of you. We ba basically, as a nation, have been raping the farmland for decades. <clears throat> that needs to change. And when you do that, uh, things like, you know, what people here are, are, I'm sure, very concerned about, um, about greenhouse gases, right? Uh, that, those, that sort of management of the land, you know, in terms of grazing, uh, you sequester more carbon. I think it was, uh, some, you know, here's a good homework assignment. There's a great TED talk by uh, Alan Sabry, who is sort of the grandfather of, of range management. He's, he's a South, South African. Uh, basically, he's done calculations where you could sequester, you know, more carbon than industry in the world generates if you only put uh, these marginal lands, you can't grow crops, you graze livestock, uh, huge impact. You can turn back the clock. So those are my comments. Thank you, Andy. He's one of my teachers. How can we organize as a community, as a buyer region, so that we can potentially weather the storm and, and continue these, you know, centuries old traditions and ways of being that are actually sustainable and regenerative. I don't think that's a question that's answerable by a single individual because it's a, no, because it's a collective project. And uh, one of the things that is increasingly obvious to me is that you think better with other people. All of my research questions came out of conversations with other Tausenos. You know, questions or issues, ideas that come out through the synergy of interaction. 
And so this is a project that um, none, no single person can direct. Uh, this is a collective project. You figure it out. We figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly scale is an issue. Uh, regeneration is going to have to be on a smaller, more local scale. Uh, the kinds of operating principles that Ostrom talks about, that she's identified, really are most effective at a certain scale. Now, there are ways to deal with that, which are what she called polycentric arrangements, different kinds of organizations at different levels, but not a hierarchy. It's pretty clear, I think, and more people realize is that the solutions are not going to come from top down. They're going to come from the bottom up. So that's us. What I want to ask is related to um, the economics of agriculture. And so uh, I was talking with my brother on this subject the other day, and we were doing some research, and we discovered that the average farmer in the United States is 57 years old, and the average farmer in the United States makes $180,000 per year. And um, I've raised all kinds of different agricultural products, and I would go to a store and see a $5 rotisserie chicken, and I'd be like, if I raise a chicken, butcher it, cook it, and serve it to you, it's definitely going to be more than $5. <laughs> and um, so we see food price inflation. I would want more like $50 for that chicken, and actually we're getting to that point. But So what I'm getting at is um, there has to be some incentive at some point, not just economic, a multiple bottom line incentive for young people to get involved with agriculture. And I think that uh, young people are discovering that they actually can make a living and support a family as farmers and working in their local community, not doing big industrial agriculture, but small scale stuff working within the Asekia system and the communities with their community. So my question is, are you seeing that type of incentive uh, bringing the communities back into the Asekias and into the farms in northern New Mexico? Are there probably people here who could answer that better than me? Um, I see it piecemeal. I see individuals trying to get back in. I mean, for example, I was talking to Corelia um, about her effort to get back to, into farming after her parents left it and the struggle that that requires because of the price of land, because of having to make a living. Um, the motivation at this point has to be strongly individual. What kind of incentives could be provided uh, in a place like Taos? Um, that would, again, is a collective project. I mean, I think that we have to start from scratch, uh, which, which isn't to say that we don't already have a lot of lessons and a lot of uh, learn, wisdom that, like that of the Asakis, like that of the traditional farmer ranchers here, um, that will help us to survive sustainably. Um, but it's, I mean, we have to reimagine, we have to imagine a post capitalist, po non growth economy. That's outside, that's outside of our imagination, right? This, we have a failure of imagination to see how could we actually, I mean, this is a beautiful valley. We still have water. There's going to be less. There's going to have to be a return to um, dry land farming. What, what you know, it, we call dry land farming, which was obviously practiced extensively by ancestral Pueblo peoples who, re, who terraformed the landscape in ways that we cannot even recognize any longer and that archaeologists using non-invasive and collaborative techniques are rediscovering in, in cooperation with, with Pueblo peoples, for example, at Picaris. Uh, we don't know how much surface water there's going to be, but we know business as usual can't go on. And the, the question is, what, when will people realize that? Well, we usually don't realize that until it's too late, right? I mean, we, we're, we're not, we don't think long term, we're, in, we're kind of into short term solutions and trying to keep, you know, I mean, we're, we're an experimental and a creative species, but we're also very conservative. We just want to keep things the way they are. Um, but pretty soon that's not going to be possible anymore. So I don't know. Uh, I mean, the incentive could be just rank survival, <laughs> basic survival. How you could re-engineer 
a system of governance and economy in the Taos Basin that was agriculturally based, small-scale agricultural farming based, but also, I think, you know, Taos should become a learning center. You know, uh, it, it should, uh, you know, continue as a center for creative arts and creation, not in quite so segregated a way. Uh, but we, we have the elements here. But how we get there, I don't know. I mean, it may require, you know, inescapable crisis to get to that point because I don't see, I mean, I'm not giving up my car. I, I don't want, I can't live without a computer. You know, I guess I suppose I could, but you know, I'm no farmer. Uh, I just hang out with them, you know. Um, <laughs> I really admire them, but <laughs> I can't do it myself. I don't know, but again, that's a collective question. Uh, yes, I mean, people after World War II stopped farming because they realized it wasn't economically viable anymore. You know, especially uh, people coming back from World War II and having been you know, exposed to much broader kinds of range of people and places and coming back. I mean, my father struggled to get into the middle class so his children wouldn't have to do manual labor, <laughs> right? I wonder what he'd say now. <laughs> After all that fancy education, here I am into the ditch, right? Uh, but, but not as a laborer, not as a laborer. I mean, I did do labor at one point, but I can't anymore. So I don't know. I mean, this requires an extraordinary leap of collective imagination. But that's what we should be thinking about. No more growth. We, we have to imagine not growing. How can we, I mean, get your head across. I mean, San Juan Chama was to, for growth and for the privatization of water. You know, I mean, we have to get beyond that. But, I mean, certainly we have the creative capacity to do that. What is going to force us to do that is not probably going to be pretty. And I'm glad I'm old. This year, more than any year, we have enough water. It's amazing how much water we have this year. And besides, we have rain. Mm -hmm. We are very blessed about that. Mm -hmm. And what you say, what is going to make us change? I don't think we will see it, that change because our kids, they are very comfortable the life we give them. And like you say, nobody will live without a computer. Everything is connected at that. But it will come the time then it will be necessity, necessity that's going to be the change for the human beings, not only in Taos, but more in the big cities than anywhere. I think we still say, I love Taos. It's amazing community. Um, we help each other. We know each other. It's a fantastic place to be in. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we have ingredients here that a lot, a lot of other places don't have. Mm -hmm. We still have them. I mean, the fact that people are still fighting for their land and water is an extraordinarily important thing. They're still doing it, even though people predicted it would it be over by now. And it's not. It's just like, you know, in the early 20th century, anthropologists said, oh, well, the Pueblo, what we can do with the Pueblos and with other Native American groups in the West is salvage ethnography because they're going to disappear. Well, they didn't. Uh, and uh, they're still going and, and under, in, in very new ways, as well as traditional ways. And I think that's true of the Asakia communities, too. They're facing almost... Uh, insurmountable conspiracy of forces to make them extinct, to get them off the land, to break the kinship ties, to destroy community, to e evaporate the opportunities for collective ritual practice. But people, uh, people in New Mexico, the, the Nuevo Mexicanos, I mean, when the church went away, they just kept going. Uh, so the creativity is in the soil and, and in the people. But what forms it's going to take, you know, uh, those of you who are under 50 or under 40 or under 30, you're the ones who are going to see it. And, and I don't envy you uh, what, you're, what, what any of us is going to see in the coming decade or two if we listen to the scientists. Let's stop listening to the scientists, how about? I can't. I can't stop listening. I mean, I'm, I'm sick of listening to the politicians <laughs> and, and to the news media and to the people who are constantly, you know, recycling the same stuff. 
Um, but um, I don't know. Is there a final question for Dr. Rodriguez? Well, let's give her. Okay, thank you.